Hey, it's Craig Syracuse and welcome to another episode of Walk in Faith, the show where we go beyond the image and we discover who our guests really are. You might know them from TV, the big screen, or even the world of sports, but do we really know who they are as a person? Do we know what motivates them? Do we know what inspires them? Well, that's what we're here to find out. Today I'm with actor Stephen Baldwin. While he showed me around his farm in the country, we talked about his relationship with God. Though raised Catholic, he moved away from religion as a teenager. And it was through a very unique way that he came back to faith as an adult. Stay tuned to hear a story. So tell me about this farm. Where are, where are we? This, this is like, a, I think I read 104 acres. Yeah, it's, uh, this is the Cassidy Farm up here in uh, Rock Tavern, New York. My wife and I are living up here, uh, renting a house on the property because beautiful. we're empty nesters. And my wife and I are doing the best we can to keep ourselves available to do ministry. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, we're very fortunate. What it's do you fun. usually do on the farm? Like, what do you like when you wake up? Well, a bunch of the chickens are my wife's, um, so she's got me carrying bags of food and chopping wood and you know keeping the fireplace going. And but then at the same time, this is a great place for prayer walks, mm -hmm. exercise, good health, quality of life. A lot of time for reflection. It's beautiful. It's such a blessing. So thank you so much. I uh, really enjoyed the conversation. Like I was saying earlier, like I've read about a lot of people, a lot of research, but you are you're so fascinating. The fact that you were a Hollywood A-list celebrity, you've been in tons of movies, produced movies, but th what fascinates me is your devotion to your faith. Mm. And now, you did where'd you grow up? You grew up in Long Island? I'm originally from Massapequa, Long okay. Island, the South Shore. Okay. And uh, my dad was a school teacher in that town growing up our whole lives. I have family in Massapequa too. Did you, do you remember the church you went to? In Massapequa? Uh, St. Rose. St. Rose. And were you always involved in the church or always involved in your faith? Well, for myself, just for me, uh, I've always been an extreme guy. It's why I drank too much and party too much and, you know, adrenaline junkie and go fast and, you know, take, take chances and all that kind of stuff. So for me, the idea of extreme has always been a part of my DNA. Mm -hmm. So, again, I was born into the Christian faith and it kind of didn't stick. But then through a sequence of, a, of events, when my wife and I were living in Arizona, I was doing a TV show called The Young Riders for ABC when my first daughter was born. So through my wife, who's from Brazil, mm -hmm. we were able to hire like a nanny cleaning lady through the family to come live with us in Arizona. Uh, to help us around the house, be a housekeeper and help with the baby, cook food. It's, in the Brazilian culture, that's kind of a normal mm -hmm. process. And uh, this gal came to work with us. Na her, her name was Augusta. And uh, when she came to work with us, after a couple of weeks, only speaking Portuguese to my wife, she explains, well, the real reason I took this job was back in my church, uh, in a prayer meeting, somebody said that God spoke and that if I came to work for you and your husband, you would become born-again Christians and be involved in ministry in the future. So my wife comes and explains this to me, and at the time I was making more money than ever and just had my first baby, and you know, if this is my road to domestic experience, then you know, life good, yeah. you know? So after about a year of working with us, Augusta and my wife became very close, and long story short is over time, everything Augusta said God said was going to happen, it happened. My wife gets saved first, she becomes very intense in her commitment to her walk with following Jesus. And in that first year of watching her, that's the thing that really started to slowly work on me was I was already married for 10 years to her. Uh, at the time, this is fast forwarding now. After Augusta, we moved back to New York after the birth of my second child. And uh, that's when my wife got saved. There was that plus 9-11 and a sequence of events that kind of just made me have no place else to turn to ask the question, what's going on? Why is all this happening? Why did my wife become born again? Like, God, what are you doing? That led to my making a decision that I was now going to explore and investigate this experience 
but in a super hardcore way because I don't know any other way to do it. So I said, God, I said the prayer of salvation. I was baptized in water. I did all the stuff you're supposed to do, but then I made a covenant. That's a very powerful word if you know what its application means in Christianity. So a covenant is, you know, till death do us part. You know what I mean? I did that with God. I said, basically, if you'll show me you're real, I'll be Kirk Cameron on steroids. <laughs> I don't care. I don't care what they say. I don't care what they, I don't care. If I know it's you, if I know it's real, I'll go anywhere you want, do whatever you want. Now, what, how did, now you mentioned about he revealed himself. Can you share that with us? How did, how did he reveal himself? Well, I'll give you an example. I'm Stephen Baldwin. I'm an actor. I'm this, I'm that. Uh, I supported President Trump because as a Christian, I believed that was the right thing to do. Uh, cut to Alec Baldwin playing President Trump on SNL. da 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 da, -da. Uh, And the opposition that my brother and I have although we haven't spoken since the election because he's upset, but uh, the very first scripture I read that spoke to me supernaturally was Matthew 10, 34, which is in the words of Jesus. It says, do not think I came to bring peace. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. What does that mean? The sword is the division between those who will believe in him and follow him the way the Bible says, and those who will believe in him and not do it the way the Bible says. And then it goes on to say in Matthew 10, 34, and I will set you against the members of your own household if you choose to love them more than me. That's what the Bible says. Um, and that's a lot of everything that just came out of my mouth. In this world, in the natural world with regular people, I realize how heavy that is. Mm -hmm. And I say to those people, how weird is it that the first scripture I ever read that like gave me a chill and this and that, it talked about if you love me first, it may cause division in your family. And I haven't spoken to my brother since the election. <laughs> that was 14 years ago I read that scripture and God was preparing me then for what's happening now. Does that mean... I choose God over my brother? Yes. I choose God over my wife, my kids, because that's what I believe. That's what he's called me and what it says in the Bible, which not everybody, like we were talking earlier, yeah. people pick and choose what they want to believe out of the Bible. So, so let me ask you, so 14 years ago when you read that, those scriptures, was that enough to sort of, not, I don't want to, let's, say, let's use the word convince you? Nope. So you doubted. So then I went to a church a couple years later. And I'm listening to the pastor like this. And in my head, I hear, you see that guy over there? And I look and I see this guy with his wife and three little kids and one older daughter. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, thank you, God. I, yeah, I see the guy, but I'm listening to the sermon. So quit bothering me. 45 minutes in my head, I hear God going, when the service is done, go tell that stranger over there these words. It's not your fault. For 45 minutes, I go like this. No, I'm not doing that. That's weird. I don't know the guy. He doesn't know me. What, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? I don't. And then the Holy Spirit said to me, remember when you said, if you choose to follow me, you'll go and do whatever I tell you to do when I tell you to do it? Yes, God, I remember when I made that commitment to you. Okay, like I said, go tell that guy it's not your fault. So I go up after the service, I go up to this guy. I said, dude, I don't even know what this means, but it's not your fault. The guy falls to his knees. That day was the 15th anniversary of his first wife's death in an automobile with the 16-year-old daughter that survived. And this was his new wife and three new kids in that church on that day with the surviving 16-year-old daughter on the anniversary of the day his wife died in an automobile accident. Now, brother, if that's coincidence to whomever, no, I don't God bless you. I don't believe in coincidence. But there's got to be people out there, right, that sort of are praying for, this, for these sort of signs, right? And usually during that period, you're sort of burning the candle at both ends, right? You're like listening to God, but then you're also, you know, doing what you want to do. There must have been a point where 
you just broke down, right, and said, you know, I need a sign. I mean, did that well, happen I, to you at all? Oh, yeah. yeah the, the two examples I just gave you are two of 200. I wouldn't say there was one specific earth-shattering thing that I said, oh, this is real. When I said to you that I read that Matthew 10, 34, what happened was I'm reading the Bible and I felt a wind from the pages hit me in the face. This thing is real. This experience is whatever you, if it's Catholic, if it's born again, whatever it is, people need to understand you were born so that at some point in your adult life when you know the difference between good and evil, sinning and choosing not to sin, et cetera, et cetera. When you have the, the knowledge of that, this experience is about simply, do you want to connect with God in the way that he intended so that you can live your life the way his will would, would have you? Everybody's walk and journey is different. I believe I'm called to evangelize in different unique ways. I did a skateboard ministry for four years. I did skate videos. I did all kinds of different stuff. Told my story in my autobiography, which some Christian ministries that have bookstores didn't sell my book. It was too honest about the truths of Hollywood and drugs and alcohol. And Now you see in a lot of Christian ministries getting more hardcore because it has to to be able to connect with the culture. As long as it stays true to the word, we should, we should be okay. But so, so why do you think God chose you? I don't think God chose me. I think God knew me before I was born and knew that in who I am and what he's allowed and what he's done and my success and my talent and all that would, would all come together in a certain timing uh, so that I could use all of that and the platform to share with people the truth. So um, I don't feel like he chose me. I just feel like I'm so blessed that in the appropriate timing, I kind of, my heart and my mind was open to receive what God had for me. Well, he did choose you that day, the day when you were in church. He chose you that day to be sort of the conduit to speak to the, the gentleman that was going through that such pain. Exactly, exactly. I mean, there was probably other people in the church at that time, right? You weren't the only one there. And right. for some reason... Well, and now I understand your question, and I want to answer that question. Why did God, here's, what I, here's how I want to answer that question. It's not so much that I think God chose me. I think it's that God has this heart to want to use people in radical ways, but there's not so many people that are willing to be used. That like, I could have done what many people in that church would have done that day and said, no, I'm just not going to go tell that guy that, and gone home. But I made a commitment. So <laughs> that's my point. So um, for, for me, this journey is not about uh, getting any credit for it. I got one tattoo on the back of my neck, neck that says 330. It's John 330. So it's John chapter 3, verse 30, which says, I must become less so that God can become more. Humility is the key for me in this whole thing is that Jesus was humble unto death. And the certain advice I have for anybody who wants to have this experience in a greater way is the more you just try to stay quiet, the more you just try to humble yourself and repeatedly have the thought or prayer, which is your will, not mine. Show, what do you want, not what I want? Because here's the thing. The Bible says only Jesus was perfect. You're not perfect. I'm, nobody Definitely. is. But in the journey of this experience, it's recognizing that that's why I need him. Because he is perfect and he can teach me by his spirit how to be like him and less judgmental, more patient, slower to get angry, more to want to be peaceful and loving, more to want to be a servant. You're right. You're, I mean, we're pretty much a representation of, of Jesus Christ. But now, you, like being in Hollywood, right? So now let's say, you know, you had this whole platform, you were a celebrity. That was let's say that was all part of God's plan, right? Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to use that platform to evangelize, to spread the word of God. Not many people in Hollywood do that. Right. I've, I've, I've noticed a lot, of, a lot of athletes do that, and I was saying there are a lot of boxers. But why aren't celebrities just, why are they so concerned about their brand and about the money, when in actuality, it's really about using that platform to inspire the kids and change the world. Why aren't there many people like you out there? The reason you're gonna see no one really 
emphatically standing up for their own individual faith in the industry. You don't see Tom Cruise going around going, give your life to L. Ron Hubbard, you know, whatever. Sorry, that was a joke. <laughs> Sorry, Tom, I love you. I'm your biggest fan. Let's work together again real soon <laughs> so I can lead you to Jesus, brother. Um, please put that in the interview. Um, the point there simply is, if I look at Mark Wahlberg, if I look at Cruz, if I look at the AAA list guys, even uh, the Australian fella, what's his name? Plays Wolverine. Oh, uh, Hugh Jackman. Yeah, very outspoken Christian. You know, I believe that it maybe it's not Hugh Jackman's calling to go out and tell everybody, be a Christian. That's okay. Maybe Hugh Jackman's calling is, be Wolverine and then do these Christian things quietly. Amen. I'm much more subscribing to that mentality now, but I know who I am and I know what God's called me to do. And that is when in the appropriate timing, whether it be to Tom Cruise's face or to an interviewer or whoever, when asked, I'm going to speak this thing the way God's calling me to speak it. Um, I think more than anything, the key in my understanding in Hollywood is Nobody has the right to believe in something that judges someone else. But Scientology does. Judaism does. All other faiths somewhere in their dogma or their doctrine judge sin or wrongdoing. But it's one thing in Hollywood for Stephen Baldwin when I say, my Bible says that this is not correct about a certain way of living. Well, if there are people in Hollywood living that way, whatever that sin is, it could be gambling, it could be pornography, it could be lust, it could, whatever it is. Um, I have no right to say, to, to judge anyone on that. If in Hollywood you are perceived as being somebody that believes in something that judges others, well, they're going to judge you too because you're not going to work in that town. You can't say Jesus in Hollywood. So if Hugh Jackman, for instance, you know, just one day decided to talk about his faith, that would affect his career? Absolutely, I believe. Even with the power that guys like Wahlberg and Jackman have and whoever it is, if you start doing a Stevie B in Hollywood... I think, it was, was, I think it was Chris Pratt, I think it was, that said something about his son. And what? then they started to, yeah, sort of blackball him a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And he's one of the biggest A-list stars on the planet. I just think it's interesting that the one faith that gets criticized the most and has the most opposition is the one that Jesus Christ is the leader of. If I was in Hollywood right now and I said I'm a Scientologist or I said I'm this or I'm that or Jewish or Buddhist or whatever, I'd be working nonstop. It's only when I say Jesus that they go, oh. And I think, though, I think Hollywood just recently, especially seeing the profits that they're making off of these movies, they'll start to increase Christian, you know, based films. Yep. Not because of the Word of God, but just because they see the revenue sources. In, in the business of indie Christian filmmaking, these smaller films, the Kendrick Brothers and Courageous and Fireproof and these little two, two three million dollar yeah. movies, that's the business I'm in right now. I'm trying to make smaller movies that look bigger, that carry the message that, hey, if they make a bunch of money and I can use that money to make more Christian movies, hey, amen. Um, but you're absolutely right. Look, look what Mark Burnett, the doors he's yeah. opened in his success. Uh, and you look at films like Exodus and these bigger studio films uh, that are now coming out uh, because of, of the success of Christian cinema right now. So I'm not surprised. Uh, I think God's got a sense of humor, and if he thinks he can convince people in Hollywood, sure, make these movies for me, <laughs> and I'll let you make a bunch of money, amen. That's cool, as long as the message starts, keeps going out. Uh, so I think the timing of that is right on track. Uh, I have nothing but respect for a guy like Jackman who's doing his thing his way or, or, or Pratt doing his thing or, or Cruz or whoever else. 
You know, a lot of these actors now are, are, are subscribing to uh, or believing in Kabbalah, things like that. Cool. Whatever gets you through the day, man. Um, but if anybody out there is walking a journey of faith where you're not in your heart or in your spirit or in your gut, if you're not absolutely 1,000% convinced and satisfied in that experience in such a way where you know you could be dead in 10 minutes if you got hit by a bolt of lightning in 15 minutes and you were, your life was over, if that's okay with you because you know where you're going and you have no concern or fear about that, God bless you because that's who I am. I am that satisfied and at peace. I, I know I'm on the right track. So if you were to die tomorrow or today, you would go, you think God would be happy the way you lived your life? I don't want to say happy. I think God would be like, oh, we're just going to let him squeak through. He gets a 65 on the regent's exam. We'll let him in. That's enough. You know, I, 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 I don't aspire to uh, have a very big mansion and a lot of cars in heaven. If I got a pretty good skateboard, What do you I'm think stoked. heaven looks like? Say again? What do you think heaven looks like? What do you picture heaven? Oh, here we go. You're asking me for prophetic answers. So the Bible says about heaven that it'll be a place where we no longer need these bodies. It's perfection. It's just our spirit. So imagine if you were somewhere and you had that moment of like, it's just you in that place of peace and whether it's looking at a sunset or whatever that is. Imagine that. Uh, perpetual, never-ending, but out of an experience when we get to heaven, it says what well, we will be singing and praising to the glory of God and loving God, and what's that like? Imagine every waking moment where you're just feeling that flow in your heart of that love and peace of God that's more powerful than anything that you get from when you look at that sunset that he created. So isn't that kind of interesting? That's one way of him to show you that experience, the potential of that feeling. I've had all this world has to offer, from fancy watches to expensive cars to all the money to all the women to all the parties. And you know what? Only Jesus, completely satisfied, only Jesus, only the Holy Spirit. Tell me about the, the Breakthrough Ministries. After I started doing skateboard ministry with an amazing organization called the Luis Palau Association, uh, they Luis Palau is kind of like the uh, considered to be the Argentinian Billy Graham, very successful ministry. So they were doing an event in 2003 in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, called Beach Fest. Two days, Christian concert, music sing and dance and talk about Jesus. And this ministry had set up a skateboard park and they were using Christian skaters to skate and kids would come and watch that and then the skaters themselves would preach. And at the time I was like, where's like the cool Christian stuff? So I made an arrangement with the Palau organization to make a skate video with those guys called Living It. And we did the Living It skate tour for a couple of two, three, four years almost and tens of thousands of kids came to faith as a result of that skateboard ministry. I went out afterwards, when I was finished in my season of doing ministry with Palau, I went out and was gonna start my own skateboard ministry called The Breakthrough, which now has been on hold for a while because of other things that God has had me doing. But it's so funny you're asking me that because we're literally getting gearing up now for 2018 in a few select cities in America to be doing uh, the breakthrough ministry and the skateboard touring again. It's a great idea. It's a lot of fun. So is it just skateboarding or do you use, because you said extreme sports. No, for the breakthrough ministry or what we call um, action sports ministry. So action sports ministry could be uh, skateboarding, BMX, motocross. We utilize all those things. And then I have these DVDs of the of the skateboard videos we did, which are just skateboarding. It's just hardcore. Some of the top skaters in the world who are Christians doing these tricks to show these kids this, that, and the other thing. 
I carry them around, they're in my truck, they're in my bag, and I give them out to skateboarders. I just go, hey, dude, you want a really cool skate video? And just when you watch it, it's got Christian Asoy and some of the top skaters in the world and Andre Genovese and you know guys that are well-respected in the skateboarding world. Uh, and I hand it to him and I say, if you want to see some of the best skating in the world, and it's got a really positive message, that's all I say. Mm -hmm. And then let that kid go watch it. And if he's down, he's down. If, I know he's going to be down with the skateboarding. So at the very least, I'm improving their skateboarding skills. <laughs> but why do you think there's like sort of a disconnect with millennials or sort of that younger demographic? Like there seems to be disconnect from church in general, but just the gospel. Now more than ever in the United States of America is this vibration of, hey, you can't judge another person. It's not right. You can't say this person shouldn't live their life like this or that. Please forgive me. I'm just the messenger. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that I believe in something and that the creator of that belief, he's the one that says, here's the rules and here's what's right and here's what's wrong. If you choose not to believe that, then God bless you, you know? Um, so I just think we're in a place, particularly now, where in the battle between darkness and light, darkness is now convincing the world, you know, you can live a life of self for you and not service. You could write a check and let somebody else do the service. That's good enough. The movement of Christianity over the last 100, 150 years has really not done such a great job as far as in our flesh, the people of Christ have said things a certain way that made this world feel judged as opposed to saying, I'm not judging you, but there is judgment in what I believe. Would you please take a look at that so that you know that for yourself? There's a big difference in me being the one that seems like I'm pointing the finger and judging and redirecting that responsibility and understanding on Jesus so that people understand it and it's perhaps more embraceable. Now, what would you say, just last question, to say a kid out there that's sort of searching for their purpose in life or they might be lost, what would you say to them directly? Because that's the difficult thing, right? What is our purpose? Why am I on this planet? Well, every one of us was born because our true father is our father in heaven. And our father in heaven wants to have children who love him. So I'm a dad. And my daughter, my, both my daughters are 24 and 20. And at that age, there's nothing I like more when those kids come up and visit this farm and sit right on this leg. And my big, tall, beautiful daughter wraps her arms around my neck. It gives me a hug and says, I miss you, dad. I love you. God wants that too. Every day. That's why you were born. So every morning I wake up and I give him a hug around his neck in prayer. The way I tell God I love you and I give him that hug every day is I wake up and I go, you're first. What do you got for me? What do you want me to do? So my message to young people is, if you'll go to your Father in heaven, if you'll go to the Creator, if you'll go to the Almighty, the All-Powerful, if you'll simply say, I saw this interview with Stephen Baldwin and I think he's nuts. But he said, if I come to you authentically and I say, if I just have a willingness to be open, if I just say to you, I really want to know, show me who you are, change me, open my heart, do for me what I can't do for myself, give me the power, give me the strength, give me the humility, show me how to serve you, he's going to answer you. Ask him to show you, mean it, and he will. That's great. This was wonderful. Oh. Really appreciate it. Thank oh, you, you so it. much. This was a great interview. Thank you. Inspiring. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much. See you next time, guys. Well, that's our show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Always remember, we have the ability to inspire and evangelize through our words and actions. Till next time, thanks for walking with us. Mm -hmm.